every week in the county jail feels like a month. Every month feels like a year. So I'm in there for almost a year. And, uh, and then I, I plea out. I get, uh, I get, I'm eligible for like a, a drug program to get a time cut. So I'm like, okay, that's cool. Um, but then they, you know, I get sent to a maximum. I've been getting in so many fights and I got so many tickets now from just being in the county jail. Internal tickets. Yeah. Up from Yeah, just write-ups and shit, whole shots, you know, 30 days in the hole. Because that'll happen if you're in there for long enough, right? Because people are constantly. Yeah, because you're and you're losing your mind just from, you know, I got in a fight with a guy who was like a buddy of mine just so we could get out of the dorm and go to the hole for a week, you know, get some jack time. Yeah. But... um so my, my security level was way up. So they, I, you know, I had to go do time in a, in a max, maximum security. Where, where? Two rivers. It's now a medium. They classed it down since then. It's now medium security. And then I was at OSP, Oregon State Penitentiary, for a couple of weeks. And that was wild because I'm like, this, is a, this it looks like Folsom. You know what I mean? They got the gun towers, old school shit, fucking drugs everywhere. Are there any, you know, you, you see this in media and stuff like that is there any sort of like talking to you separation you're gonna go with these guys oh yeah it's all it's all segregated i mean it's not uh it's not as serious as california prisons yeah. right but uh but yeah it's completely segregated like that but it's not racist i mean look i play basketball with black people and i'm working in the kitchen next that's time. what i was gonna ask you like did anybody look you up and down and say can you play ball <laughs> <laughs> of course of course they did yeah no i got recruited i got drafted my first day in there it's probably look at you like hey, look at this larry bird looking mm -hmm. motherfucker uh, that yeah that, i mean that was an asset i, I imagine for sure for sure fuck it a yeah but there's no taboo around that you just can't like people are doing business cigarettes drugs you know you just don't you don't usually Actually, it is taboo what I did playing with the with the blacks, but uh, but races are mixing all the time in there, right? Yeah. So it's it's just you sit with your own race, you 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 are on the yard working out with your own race. Yeah, your uh, but but that's about it. Every everybody else is where everybody's doing business, you know. And when you say everybody's doing business, I imagine you're learning more about your trade craft in there that you wish you learned in the past. Yeah, for sure. No, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, this is basically basically a concentration of people that have hindsight and also experience. Yeah. So these places are fucking universities. Course. That's college. Core. Oh my god. The, what are you the learning? Department of Connections. That's <laughs> what we called it. <laughs> <laughs> what are, What are you learning in there? They're like, "What the fuck? You ha how much cash? You know?" And <laughs> yeah. So everybody had a story about how I fucked up. You know, everybody. Had, you know, just makes me feel horrible. But uh, what did I learn? I mean, definitely like, oh. It, definitely that I didn't need that much cash to like get out of the game and start like a legitimate business. That was like the, the real moral of the story is like, I completely overdid it. You, you overshot, I mean? you overshot yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So they were like, well, yeah, you fucked up, you know, by, by just having it on you like that. I mean, it's, it's plain and simple. Like possession is nine tenths of the law. And that's part of the reason that I started shipping product. Cause it's like, I don't want to be, you know, unless my phone is tapped, I'm not in possession when that box arrives to that person in Manhattan, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know, you, you get... That, so they were saying, how much would would have been enough for you to just to start figuring your way out? 500 grand? Yeah, right, exactly. So it was more... I didn't learn as much... I mean, I heard a lot of crazy stories, but <laughs> problem, most of them were not true. Everybody's a liar in jail. No. <laughs> if you can believe it. But no, it was mostly like my studying and reading and learning where I'm like, damn, yeah, I really didn't have to. Because when I got a chance to like step away from the game, that's when I really got to put things in perspective. And, yeah. and like I never had time to really like consider what yeah. else I could do with my life. Because you're too busy right. doing it. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, what, is the, what, is, what, is it, what is that life after you come out of that? Well, I got out in 2012 and then i moved to la and you know, started doing stand-up comedy pretty soon after that i was taking acting classes writing screenplays and shit that's, a, that's an absurd it's a hard pivot <laughs> that's an absurd pivot so you so you go you go to la which is you know it is it is its own place yeah uh you start doing comedy 
Yeah, 2014. I was or originally I wanted to be like an actor and a screenwriter and shit like that, but it yeah. just isn't wasn't wasn't for me. What what's your early material like look like? What God, what, what are you what, what are you what are you? It, it my early on? material was like cleaner. Like I didn't I was ashamed. I didn't want to talk about prison, so I was like trying to be like a much more like observational comic. Um but then I started like telling like thinking about all the funny shit that happens in prison, I started like doing jokes. You know, I would do jokes about that and it would just kill and people would be like, that's so fucking interesting. Yeah. Like talk about that more. So that's how I started to so like. You were you were kind of keeping that side of that past of you hidden because you wanted to be something else. And yeah, then... I wanted to be like accepted by the industry. But by then the industry was all, it was being overtaken by social media so rapidly that I, it, yeah, yeah, it didn't even matter, you know. So you started talking openly about the funny side of a very dark fucking yeah thing yeah but there's so much funny to it there's so much yeah. funny so yeah. so but and then like everybody like during like the mid 2010s everybody was podcasting you know yeah. podcasting with joe rogan was blowing up i saw you i think in what 2018 yeah something like that yeah um and i'm like that's fucking cool i was like and then i would see these fucking these funooks these fucking maricons <laughs> from uh vice news Talking about the drug game, talking about the Sinaloa cartel. You know, like, okay, so so you start some assholes from Oxford. You, yeah, we're gonna get into this, okay. which is which is great. Uh, you, you uh, I mean, you you start doing comedy, you start speaking openly about some of the things that not only did you have direct experience, but you know, you have an emotional suffering attached yeah. to some of those things. So you, yeah. So when you talk about some of these things, even in a funny way, there's a, almost a responsibility there. Mm. You know, in a lot of ways. You start seeing people online, social media, Vice, which I have issues with, but we're, we're, we'll talk about it. But you start seeing basically these tourists of a sort right. showing up in a field somewhere mm -hmm. with a, where a guy's cooking up a, a batch of, yeah. of meth somewhere in right. Sinaloa with a stick and uh, <laughs> asking them, you know, in this Aussie accent or English accent, asking them these absurd fucking questions I that heard you you as a you as a dealer as a dealer so like you this guy asking like is your mind just in pain listening to this this guy just asking the most stupid questions i heard a guy and i think this was either vice or like a british national geographic maybe was he a buff guy i know that when not ross camp Ross Kemp was old school. Yeah. He was like an old school like documentary. He actually had pretty good documentaries. But this guy was, he went to Culiacan and he was talking to this guy who had a mask on, right? And he was like, what would you do right now? And this is a serious question. He really asked this. He really like thought about this and wrote this down in his things to ask this guy. It's moleskin notebook. <laughs> what would you do if you found out I was a police officer? And the guy was like, what the f... Are you really going to make me answer that? He don't know, literally, because, like, Mexicans are so fucking cool. Like, he, he, like, didn't, like, he didn't bite. You know what I mean? He's like, am I in danger right now? And the guy was like, if you don't cause problems, like, no, oh, we're, we're chill. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Mexicans have a real, like, logic. Like, they don't, you know, that you guys, there's, there's something about the Mexican sensibility that's... Really makes you feel like an idiot sometimes. Uh, our, our our normal is absurd. Our baseline normal is absurd right. as a Mexican. And I mean, I'm like, and I was so I felt so bad for that whoever that guy was. I think he was like a hitter. They said he'd killed a bunch of people. But I was like, this is the worst interview I've ever seen. Um, and it wasn't until, but it wasn't until the pandemic when you know everybody was making online content co co covid and, hit and everybody was stuck yeah exactly and we were just doom scrolling exactly exactly and i had written a book a novel about my experience and it did pretty well and you know but i looked i was just watching like you know it was a mix of how much i hated like that journalistic approach to filming like narco content and then also watching like Ex gangbangers who had channels like that. Oh yeah, the, who were the, like the craziest shit I seen in a Mexican prison. But I'm like, okay, and that has like 10 million views. But it's it's horrible production quality. He's not articulate. He's not very articulate, and he doesn't have like. There's no entertainment value behind that. Like, well, okay, what if I melded the two? What if yeah. I what if I married 
the journalism with the actual like real hand experience and articulated it from a real perspective. So, you know, and also normal the, people can understand. And also the entertainment aspect of it because yeah. you're now entertaining people right. with your stories and mm -hmm. storytelling is a big part of actually communicating an experience. I mean, there's no way, I, mean, I can tell you what putting something up your ass and doing a kite from one prison to another might look like from my point of view, but how can you articulate it to somebody that hasn't been there? Right. Yeah. That's, so, so I was like, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. We're just going to like, forget about the being overtly comedic. Let's like, let's, let's start putting these videos out. You, and you started uh, by basically sharing some of your exactly, personal story. Exactly. And it just overnight, it just fucking blew up. Now, you did, know? You, did you start, did you start like, Hey, let me see who I can invite over that would want to talk about some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. So I ran out of my own story. Uh, so that's, that's why I started interviewing other people, you yeah. know, you, uh, when I, when I was, when I was there at your place and I, I've been looking at, looking at some of the other interviews. Yeah. I think you recently interviewed, uh, this lawyer that I've been following for a while. Yeah. Rosenberg. Rosenberg. Shout out to is, Rosenberg. He is I don't think he's like he's not real. He's great though. He's an amazing lawyer. Yeah, I, he's he's a robot though. He like he, he wouldn't give us anything. But he was he, he gave us everything and nothing. Amazing guy though. Like I'm fascinated by mm -hmm, that dude. Mm -hmm. um, having people over and talking about some of these things. I mean, as somebody that has experience with it, and how some things are not supposed to be talked about. How things uh, sometimes are kind of like quiet or dangerous for people to talk about. Like what what type of what type of measurement or guesstimation do you have as far as talking to some of these people? Do you prepare for it? Or yeah, you yeah. Try and outline that. So a few people that I've talked to in the middle of the interview, I'm like, "Oh, you're fucking lying to me." <laughs> yeah, I don't like that. But we still put the interview out because yeah. we just gotta. We're putting out content. We're a machine now. But I try to. No, I try to get as much information out of them as possible. I try to, that's that's what I pride my show on is like how it actually works. Like, what is it really like? Because they're not touching on like, and so for, for, I still really haven't figured out how cartels exactly work in Mexico. Yeah. And I was at, for like six months, I was obsessed with bringing people on my show who could shed light on it. And I think I have a better grasp of it, but I just think it's a very complicated thing. And I don't think there's one answer. But, um, it's, you know, you came on and gave me a really a, a diametrically opposite answer to, you know, my friend Luis, who's a journalist. Yeah. So I, I think I've kind of like made my peace with the fact that like you're never, there's not, not going to be a scientific answer to these things. I, I guess like Luis Chaparro, great. Great, great guy. guy, amazing yeah. to risk taker. Yeah, no like, shit. Kind I get of, scared for him sometimes. Yeah, actually, yeah, amazing guy though. Yeah, uh, but I, I think perspective is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not a journalist. I worked on the ground and I did things and I worked with people, and I got to experience things directly. Not only by working in law enforcement in one of the most dangerous cities on the planet at that point, mm -hmm. which is now again on, on that list. Yeah. Um, but going after people that I used to hang with and skateboard with, mm -hmm. who then turned into heavy hitters for, right. for cartels. Uh, and then going through that process, being basically used up by the government here until mm -hmm. I was no longer useful and being fucking shat out like a yeah. discarded. Um, yeah. And seeing the whole process from high levels, because I was involved in security uh, of politicians at the highest level. And also I was involved in, you know, operations at the ground level. Mm -hmm. So I got to see a larger scope of the, of the issue and the problem. Right. Now, how do cartels work and how do they operate? I think what's changed, at least when I was active to now, is that like, we used to call them la mano peluda or the hairy hand is the way we would call it, right? <laughs> right. Uh, or, like there was different, la mania. We would have these different ways of calling it. And all of these names involve multiplicity. So like la mano peluda, it's different fingers. Mm. And we were part of a very successful fight, at least in my area is a responsibility. So, so much so that uh, the guy that used to lead us, who I actually had on the podcast, Lisa Ola, 
He's currently in the running to have his old job back, and he's trying to get his old team together. Right oh, now. wow. Right? But I am. Fuck that. Has he tried to recruit you? Yeah. But I'm, yeah. I'm fucking gone. Uh-huh. No fucking way. Um, and also, I couldn't pro- probably couldn't pass the piss test for me, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, but uh, th- what I've, what has come apparent to me is that whatever that problem was in the past, let's say 10 years ago, where it's a single organization that has different uh, federations around it that then sends drugs to the U.S. and then has some sort of control over what they're doing, has become almost global yeah. in its way. Things that people don't take into account when it comes to the what a cartel is now is the fact that they have supply lines coming in from China. Mm. That it is very much politicized and very much utilized as a weapon of destabilization against the United States now. Right. There's no single cartel in Mexico. There's hundreds of small yeah. entities in Mexico that thrive on local drug markets. Right. But also on making a highway to the U.S. as far as drugs. That's a huge thing that I've realized is that a lot of these, what's going on here in Tijuana, and we were talking about this off pod, and what's happening even in Juarez, there's huge demand, local demand for drugs. I always thought these were battling it out for control of drug routes to the U.S. No. I was like, Mexicans don't have money to buy meth. Yeah, I mean. They do. I mean, a lot of You know. Uh, Ovidio and a lot of the Los Chapitos and what's happening out there, they're fighting for local mm-hmm. markets. Yeah. Like that, a lot of the conflict is local. Yeah. So there's money in, in these domestic markets, even though, even though it's pesos, it's uh, still lucrative. Yeah. Probably makes up for money that they've lost from now that the weed export market is basically done, right? There's no, there's not much of an export to the U.S. anymore. But so the American dream is... Mexico. Yeah. Now, right. well, I mean, Tijuana is an example of yeah. that. Uh, Tulum is horrible right now because of all the Americans living down there. Yeah. And uh, seeing some of the killings and violence in some of the resorts is a sign of local drug markets now no longer needing to export a bulk of their product. They could just keep it in Mexico because this is where right. the Americans are partaking in the same behaviors that they would in the U.S. Is there enough of a demand from expats for drugs to cause violence in a place like Tulum? Yeah. Wow. I mean, they're, they're, you're already seeing it. Right. Um, it's not just that. It's also other aspects of diversification with some of these criminal organizations. I mean, it's just not – so let's say here uh, it's drugs, it's people. money – People, money laundering, people launder, people uh, trafficking, and uh, in paid extortion or paid protection mm. rackets that uh, make them. I mean, we we just had uh, probably four or five uh, smoke shops that popped up that are popping up all over Tijuana, being burned, and mm. I think one of the employees were killed. And these is clearly paid protection type things yeah. where they're being warned that's to, like that's like italian mafia kind of shit right that's like you're gonna pay a piso yeah yeah and that's happening here mm-hmm. and also you're seeing i mean if you go to colombia now you're gonna see a lot of mexicans down there yes of course we know that they're yes. now cooking and making fentanyl in in luxury apartments in bogota yeah I and think. they're also funding coca leaf grows in southern colombia yeah. wild basically. mexico has some dangerous parts to it and there's some dangerous things i mean if you're a drug dealer in mexico and you're working for a single cartel guess who are you who are you a target of the you're rival the, cartel yeah, yeah. because you're the only at least go. exposed part of that organization on a street corner trying to sell your shit that's that's mostly who gets killed here mm-hmm. uh but then you start going into these there's a lot of them so there's a lot of competition and there's less money to be made on drugs so they have to expand. So paid extortion. You know, um, then you get these organizations are now involved in trafficking people. Mm. So now we have armed security on the Mexican side, and it's not the government; it's the cartels. Right, right. So you start seeing this. But gringos don't who move down here don't see any of that. They, do they? I mean, like they're you're not to touch a gringo, right? Remember they, they killed those people in uh, like Nuevo Laredo. Yeah. Remember that? And yeah. they wrote the, and the the cartel, I think it was like the Cartel del Golfo or whatever. They wrote an apology. Yeah, they were like, that was not us. And they, yeah. get, they made the guys go turn themselves in. Yep. Uh, it's it's a beehive that they only shouldn't kick. Right. But with 
the way things are now, I think it's bound to happen. And on the U.S. side, you are seeing people progress this whole policy of, you know what, we might have to intervene. Yeah. So you you start to seeing it's a it's it's a it's bound to happen where an event of a certain nature happens right. where the U.S. is forced to respond. Oh, interesting. And I don't I don't I don't see it happening in any other way than a some sort of armed see m- I intervention. I, I like to think I know Mexican drug cartels and the the logic like they see gringos as dollars. Like oh, why yeah. would you harm your you're the hand that feeds you. I don't, I, you know, I don't see mm-hmm. some like big massacre happening no, on like expats. You no, know what I mean? No doubt with the Sinaloa cartel and some of its historical yeah. members, but the new entities that are coming out. Oh, right. Cause they're just wild. They're cowboys. It's, it's, they're, they're, they're not, they're not a legacy brand. Right. You know, they're, right. they're, they're basically coming up and the way they operate is, Militarized. They'll so, do they have to get if they want to like operate in you know territory that's claimed by Jalisco? Do they have to go get permission? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's and it's not just them. I mean, you have the new the, the, the Noroeste cartel on right. the eastern side, right. and all these smaller groups that are basically looking to see who they're going to join. I mean, mm-hmm. you go to places like Colima, and you have this whole swat of the cartel that. Just switch sides from, from who one to year who? to our, from uh, new generation to Sinaloa, like in right. a, like in a year. All right. of it, now that's Sinaloa territory. Right. Now it's so it's basically a chess game. Yeah, and what you saw, what what I see is that there it's yes, yeah, Sinaloa has been basically the it's, it's hard to say the good cartel, but it is they are it's, the better. It, it's the stable, yeah, historically stable. Let's keep shit on the down low mm-hmm. let's just do business cartel there they seem more white collar you know like a lot of those and i don't know how much truth there is to this but you know according to luis the way a cartel like that operates is that you have two different lanes you have your drug dealers and then the the militarized wing so the people going to the people funding like fentanyl cooks in colombia these are white collar guys who yeah. probably own agricultural fields they have huge real estate companies they send their kids to private schools they're white or they're a lot lighter skinned and they live you know in the really glitzy area of Culiacan and they mix with politicians at cocktail parties and they have no never touched a gun they yeah. probably never even killed anybody yeah so uh and but in order to take over and essentially what the cartel does is those are the armed, you know, brown people that basically protect the shipments, pay bribes, and and then, you know, go touch a motherfucker yeah. if, if shit goes sideways. Yeah. Is that, does yeah. that's, it sounds right. It I don't sounds know. right. I think the missing piece and something that's come to light in the past three years, there was a thing called the Wakamaya leaks recently. Okay which was basically our version of WikiLeaks. Right. Uh, somebody somewhere, maybe the opposition party, somebody, leaked a shitload of Mexican army documents online. And in those documents that are basically army intelligence documents, mm-hmm. they state which parts of the country different military regions are going to favor as far as what cartels are going to work for or what cartels they, they favor. I mean, this is written by them. Wow. There's no getting around them. <laughs> which political parties align to which cartel in certain places mm-hmm. and who's paying for what campaign? We live in a day and age in Mexico where every single political party has a sponsored yeah. cartel. I right. mean, every, so they're politicized, Yeah, which means they're very much attached. Can I ask you something? Then how does the army fit in? Are they the ones who organize and facilitate all of this? Like, They're, how does the army fit in between the the spot, the cartel sponsors and the politicians? The army is the only permanent institution in Mexico. They don't go away. They don't get voted out. They don't get not elected. And it sounds like they don't even listen to orders from Mexico City. At some points, the I mean, well, the president. I mean, I like mean, the executive branch. Well, the example of this is Socule Canaso, right? Which was basically a group of federal uh federal agents 
part of an intelligence organi- organism of some sort that found themselves in front of the chapel's son, which they didn't know they were going to arrest. Mm-hmm. And uh, they had to let him go after basically a whole city was being held hostage. Right. And then later on, they got their revenge by actually grabbing him. Right. And if people don't think that there's any sort of communication or interaction between two entities, uh, later on, his head of security was arrested without a single shot, disarmed and asleep in his house. Mm -hmm. So he was probably... Waiting for them. Handed over. Yeah. On a platter. Right. So there's there's some sort of controlling element, overall Mm -hmm. overlapping... So then, then what, where is the money motivation? Obviously, you see what, how the politicians, uh, they fear for their lives, too. Politicians get killed every day in, in Mexico, right? Yeah. yeah. But they also are, they want to be funded, and they want to take bribes, and they want to get paid. But how does the army get paid from all this? I mean, the military, have, I'm sorry. Well, they're currently now having contracts in airports. They're building airports now, which they didn't use to oh, wow. train the, 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 the Tren Maya, which is a mega project. They're trying to do their. We're trying to do a Mexican Panama Canal. Who do you think is going to have that contract? Yeah, right. Think about it. A Mexican Panama style canal. So where does that go through? The army. No, but where? How? What river? Oh, what body of water is connecting? They're going to. The they're they're, they're to trying the to figure. They're going. They're going to try and figure out a channel. Wow. So the army. So essentially, we're talking about bid rig. Bid rigging at the highest level. So all of those high level generals are getting those bids, and they, I'm sure, have shell companies. That that deploy, that, right? that that is the untalked about unknown right. darkness about this whole conflict. Right. I think, and I, I think, at least when I started, you saw a militarization of the war against, like the, the whole Felipe Calderon war against drugs. Yeah, you saw them come out of the the military barracks to fight, mm. and they are not going back. Yeah. So I think that's so, the that's the. That's a maverick. That's the unknown player that people are just not paying attention to. Right. So they want stability. They want they want uh, the cartels to have a healthy, uh, to have healthy different territory where they can operate, and the, well, to what, further their to further their aims of like the development of Mexico. They see what's yeah. happening. They see how yeah. Mexico is going to turn into like the China the, the, in terms of manufacturing, we, and they're we, positioning themselves to. To benefit from that. two things happened this year that are pretty that's past year that's pretty interesting. Uh, we have record remesas, which is money coming from Mexicans living in the U.S. Yeah. coming sending money back, mm-hmm. which doesn't make any sense because Mexican immigration is at an all time low. Right. So where does all this new money coming from? I guess. Right. Which is weird. People should pay attention to that. And we also saw the Sinaloa cartel send an armed convoy from their controlled territories all the way down south to Chiapas right. to fight the new generation cartel right. on federal roads. No roadblocks, no gunships. Yeah. So they're a chess piece. Yeah. Something's going on right. that is basically trying to stabilize things internally. So well, I think I think a lot of that has to do with migration. They're trying to stop – they're trying to basically militarize the Mexico's southern border – and so in exchange for that, they allow drugs yeah. to pass through. Migration, from Guatemala into- migration is Mexico's only bargaining chip with the United States. Mm-hmm. Right. And the last time that was an issue was when we had all the migrants camped out in Tijuana. Mm-hmm. And Mexico basically u- utilized that as a bargaining chip with the United mm-hmm. States. And Trump said, well, we're going to do tariffs, fuckers. Right. Figure it out. Yeah. And that stopped for a bit. But that's gone now. Trump's gone. We didn't have a different... He might person. be back. He looks. He's probably Dude, going to be back. If he comes back, unless he gets killed or or just imprisoned without uh, a trial, everything, everything at him. And he's Teflon, dude. It's, it's he's Teflon. Fascinating. Yeah, it's kind of inspiring. You're like, I. I mean, I, this guy can overcome anything. I, so can I. You know, it's a weird one because Mexicans look at him like, ah, yeah, I can get mm-hmm. him. Which is funny because he speaks a lot of shit. It's yeah. It's he has a Latin boat mostly. Yeah. Um. You, uh, you're, you're, you're heading into the territory of actually going out there and actually talking to somebody. That's, that's where you're going next, I guess, with your project. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what? I'm not going to do so much of that. Uh, make too much money just from the, the living room, you know what I mean, so to speak. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing a lot of, 
I am. We we've done some vlog episodes and some really cool things. We're gonna go to Colombia. Uh, I would like to organize something with us where we actually can shoot something on the ground, but here, but, uh, you know, with the internet, the, the, the business leads, not the art. Yeah. So it's like, I'd love to shoot a documentary that takes three months, but I need to replicate that every week. Yeah. So, you know, the thing about YouTube is like, can, I'm trying to make it like fast food. Like we're going to make something cool for as fuck for 15 minutes and we're just going to keep replicating it because there's so much to talk about. Like, I want to talk about Canada. What's going on there? I want to talk about Mexico. You know, I'm going to do an episode about Tijuana. I want to talk about, uh, I talked, did an episode coming out about Ecuador. There's so much happening. I can't possibly be there, uh, yeah. you know, nor, nor do I necessarily want to do that much traveling. So we're going to do news pieces from with some B-roll from uh, the safety of uh, the great United States. It's, it's, well, it's, it's, it's a place. It the, was once. <laughs> it was once. The border <laughs> is becoming less and less relevant, and I'm feeling more at home in places like Portland. Yeah. Where I see, I mean, I see the same issues, which is interesting. Yeah, Portland's a pretty good place, though. They've cleaned up a lot of the homelessness, a lot of the crime. That's just all right-wing yeah. hype. San yeah. Francisco is fucked up. A oh, yeah. San Francisco is, is unless, almost as fucked up as they say. Unless you're the president of China visiting. Yeah, they clean exactly. Up, they, they fucking exactly. clean everything up for President Ma, uh, it, President uh, Xi. It's sad, man. Like it's, uh, But that's what happens when you have a monopoly on politics. Yeah. So, you know, you, you, like really, like you understand sometimes where you're just like, ugh, I am going to move to Mexico. Because at least the... It, the dishonesty is just like a way of life. Like there's, there's almost no bones. Even though, of course, Mexicans, you guys put on airs, right? Like yeah. You never really, but we kind of all, everybody kind of knows. But like yeah. Americans are still posturing, like, like we wait, really wait, live wait. in a meritocracy. Yeah. You know. Well, I mean, the peso is one of the most stable currencies mm -hmm. on the planet. Yeah. It's probably because China's hitting the tank, and mm -hmm. we're probably standing in the next China. Yeah. I mean, yeah. this, the, things are going to boom. Yeah. I hope so. And I, and look, you, you look at these migrants and like, it's like stay in Tijuana. There's jobs here. Yeah. Why the fuck are you going to come to the U.S.? Like, it's you're going to suffer more there than you would, you know, you, you get paid in pesos here, but you're not going to be homeless. You can live in a colima. You can live in a house up made of mud. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like, but that isn't that better, though? I mean, we had a bunch of Haitian immigrants, the first wave that hit, and they were welcomed. My yeah. locals. I mean, my dad hired like five of them. Yeah. And they, for some reason, we're, Mex we're Tijuana people think everybody that's black is going to speak English for some reason, <laughs> you know? So we kept trying to speak English to these people or fucking speak French. Yeah. Um, but uh, they were great. I mean, they're, yeah. they're great. Yeah. Uh, uh, low level jobs were being filled by them. And mm -hmm. now you see them as business owners and they're I mean, great people. Living in Tijuana. Living in TJ. Damn, dude. Now we have black people and it's like cool. And wow. they dress amazing. Right. I don't know. They're, they're fucking great people. Wow. That's uh, really but crazy. Then, but then the Hondurans came. And some of the migrant waves came. And they're complete, it's a completely different mindset mm. uh, that some of these guys are coming from. I mean, you're seeing videos of them, you know, doing wheelies on their motorcycles in New York City. Right. And basically finding the cops and saying, like, we don't want to leave these free housing that you gave us. Yeah. That's a different type yeah. of immigrant. That's a that's an entitled criminal kind of. That's just a different type. Mm -hmm. uh, net migration from Mexicans into the United States is down, way down, and it's probably because we're running out of youth, also because right. you know people are not having that many kids. You know where they're coming from? Still in Mexico is Chiapas. Yeah, oh yeah. That's yeah. we interviewed a group of migrants in a for this channel that's coming out. And because we met a coyote, but he's a Mech, he's an American guy, but he works out of El Paso and he was wearing a mask. You'll see the episode. What, what, what's what's the new channel you're coming out with? Oh, it's just going to be called Johnny Mitchell. So it's going to be a spinoff of the connect, awesome. but but no guests. But you can actually go watch this episode on the connect. I'm walking on the border wall in El Paso right across from across from Juarez with this guy with a mask on. And he's like so many people from Chiapas. And yeah. that's because it's on fire right now. Yeah, yeah. From all the cartels. It's a, it's it's uh there's a there used to be when there was still supposedly is this Azeta Elen, this revolutionary group down yeah. there that uh lifted itself from the uh from uh that basically rose up in arms against the government and they're basically laying down arms 
and taking up no. key, bricks. Yeah, because they, you know, the cartels are too dangerous. Oh, really? So, so that was like the Zapatistas. Yeah. Oh. So the, the, the a lot of the, that that thing I mentioned where the Sinaloa cartel basically traversed the country to fight the new generation cartel all the way right. down there. It's that area. It's an, it's on yeah. fire. And they also have. Um, I know because Mexico is industrializing. Like when they find like minerals. They'll use cartels to basically clear out indigenous people so companies can take the land. Yeah. And I mean, again, it's it's the problem is so complex and everybody's in on it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the main ending of most of these stories down mm -hmm. here. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Where yeah. can people see your stuff? Just watch uh, the Connect with Johnny Mitchell, and then just you know, I'm I'm on the internet. You know, to subscribe to both of my channels. You'll see the videos. Uh, follow me on TikTok, Mr. Johnny Mitchell. Same thing on Instagram. You know, if you live in the states, uh, I'm out on the road doing stand-up comedy. So you know, I just post about it. Just go find me on all those platforms, man. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. We're about to hit some tacos, probably. Yes which is going to be an experience and just roll around and look around. Fuck yeah, dude. Cool, man. Thanks, Thank you brother. for coming down. Now, my pleasure. <laughs>